Hey, welcome to Beyond the Scenes, the Daily Show podcast that goes a little deeper into segments and topics that originally aired on the Daily Show. Th- th- this is what this podcast is. This podcast, like you, you ever go get a haircut, you get a fresh haircut, right? And then at the end of that haircut, you lay down and they give you that hot towel and the steam just seeps into your pores. And just for a couple of seconds, life is perfect and none of the problems that you were thinking about were permeating into your subconscious. And then they snatch that towel off and you're back out into the world with your problem. That's what this podcast is. The wonderful hot towel of progress. Today, we are discussing trophy hunting in Africa. This is a topic that Trevor covered during the segment we call, If You Don't Know, Now You Know. Play the clip. What's interesting about trophy hunting is that we all assume people do it because they don't care about the animals, but according to the hunting community, they do this because they care too much. I know it sounds contradictory, but Hunters love animals. Hunters are the ones that are giving so much back to preserving these wild species. A lot of people talk about conservation, but hunters are the real um, conservationists. Everybody thinks that the easiest part is pulling the trigger, and it's not. That's the hardest part. But you gain so much respect and so much appreciation for that animal. Wow, that's one hell of a way to show your appreciation and respect. Another argument trophy hunters use is that they're actually getting rid of the slower, weaker animals who are holding back the rest of the herd. But that might not be the full story. Trophy hunters kill some of the biggest, most magnificent animals, which is bad for the health of the species because genes may no longer be passed on to future generations. By taking those guys out of the gene pool, it weakens the genes of the entire population. Over the last 30 years, the average size of a male lion has dropped specifically because of trophy hunting. That's right. Despite what they say, trophy hunters actually like to target the strongest specimens which I don't support, but honestly, I mean, I understand. It's called trophy hunting for a reason. Yeah, you want it to look like you battled an alpha male to the death, not like you snuck into its nursing home and then smothered one of the lions with a pillow. Just like, shh, (laughs) go to sleep, Scar, go to sleep. Joining us to help break down this topic, I have two people. One of them is a Daily Show writer and the pride of Uganda. One of the most stylish people, and he is the first person on, the last person off the dance floor at the Daily Show Christmas party. Not that that detail has anything to do with his expertise on this topic. Mr. Joe Opio. J.O., how you been, brother? I've been doing great. We are back in the office, as you probably know. So we are slowly easing back into work. And the pandemic, you know, it was tough. It was tough, but nothing that someone who grew up in Africa hasn't faced before, so... Yeah, I'm happy to well, be here. I'm, it's a pleasure to discuss this particular topic. Joe, I'm I'm happy that you're that we're back in the office as well because now we have somebody to help you with technology to get you on the show. That's why it's been so long. We've been trying to get you on the show, but getting you to set up a microphone at that again, a topic that has nothing to do with what we're discussing today. Also joining us is an anti poaching activist and the author of the book Undercover Trophy Hunter. He is Eduardo Gonzalez. Eduardo How are you doing over there? You over there in the UK? Where are you joining us from right now? I am in the cold and grey UK, and uh, and wow, it's uh, it is pretty grim over there. And um, yeah, but look, I'm very happy to talk about this issue. Great fan of the show. We do actually get to see it every now and again here in the UK. And uh, yeah, I mean, whatever you want to know, I'm going to see if I can answer those questions. Well, I appreciate you for joining us from somewhere as grim and as dark, you know, it, 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 like that's why I like Europe. Europe is just grim and gray now. America, we have a grim and gray future. Big difference, but nice and sunny. So, Joe, I'll start with you. A lot of topics on the show usually come from writers that are close to the issue or have some level of connection to the issue in the real world. How did trophy hunting in Africa come into play and whose idea was it to do a segment on this? It's kind of hard to attribute uh, credit to a particular person, but I think this was mainly Trevor because the topic had been percolating in the air. People had been talking about it for some time. And this is, if you know Trevor, this is a classic Trevor segment. It's global in scope. Uh, It's complex in nature. It's uh, very, very nuanced because Trevor hates things that are black and white. He loves mm-hmm. like exploring the gray. And this topic like gave him that. And it's also 
of course about Africa mostly so that was close and dear to his heart but uh, I think it the conversation was in the air especially because pictures are, pictures are emerged of Don and Eric posing with these animals they had killed, they had slaughtered. And then like a few years before that, there was of course talk about the dentist and Cecil the lion. So it was a topic that was in the air. And it was a kind of topic that usually, because of the qualities I discussed, resonates with Trevor. And so he set our team, our crack team uh, of researchers, the tag team to work on it. And they brought the research in and it was still as engaging as they thought it would be. And so... We sat down, wrote it, and then we came up with a great ender, which was the, a sketch about a rich African coming to New York to hunt down uh, <laughs> white people's pets. And the yeah. segment was a go, but it was a tough, tough segment. It was a tough segment to do more than most simply because it involved the slaughtering of animals. And the thing is, The Daily Show is a comedy show, so we have to make the thing funny. Correct. And that was tough. That was really what? tough because it's, a, it's like trying to do basically a segment about the war crimes that Russia is committing in the Ukraine. You have to make people laugh. You're not a straight news program. People have come for the comedy. So that made it tough. But it was, I thought, and Trevor thought, and the entire Daily Show team thought, an issue worth exploring. Now, see, for me, being dumb American and my scope of knowledge on this is basically hunting video games where you go on some big game reserve where, you know, you pay money and you pay for whatever you kill. But then there's also the aspect of poaching, which is a like it's all abhorrent, but one version is legal, one version. is. What were some of the reasons that you all started discovering as to why people participate in trophy hunting? When we started doing the research and when uh, the tag team got onto it, we found that it's a sport to people. They call it a sport, of course. Uh, the argument that people are against it say this is a sport where one team has no idea that they are participating. If it's a sport, then both teams should know that they're competing and both teams should actually be on a level competing field but Once we the animals need a gun yeah yeah we realize that so many people were passionate about it so many people like both pro and anti were passionate about it the hunters of course have their reasons and among the reasons i think the two that really st stuck out to me were one that actually trophy hunting is one of the most effective ways this is what they said it's one of the most effective ways to conserve endangered species and animals. I see Eduardo laughing because he thinks that's laughable, but there are, these people really genuinely believe this. They go like, hey, it's like, I feel like it's like, you know, when, it's like if, <laughs> it's like if your parent was abusing you and then he was going like, yeah, this is the best way to raise you. So they were saying, actually yeah. one of the things they said is we love animals. The hunters genuinely say this and they believe it. They say, we love animals and that's why we hunt them. And then they say, actually the hardest thing is shooting the animals. And of course, the rejoinder would be, you know you can just shoot pictures of the animals if you love them so much. So they said the hardest thing is to pull the trigger. And again, it feels like an abusive parent telling you, this hurts me more than it hurts you, but I have to do it because I love you. But they genuinely believe this. And of course, they also genuinely believe that every money they pay to hunt these big game animals actually helps conserve the animals. So for me, that was very, very surprising. And it was like, it was the genuine belief that they have, that they love the animals and they're helping conserve the animals by hunting them. That surprised me most. Well, I am appreciative that I was able to be in a sketch with you on this and show off my inauthentic African accent up it was against terrible. your authentic, it first of all. Now, what you're not gonna do is disrespect my accent that I've been working on. I've been, I've been trained at Juilliard. <laughs> not I'm Juilliard, saying... Juilliard, it's next door. I, I'm saying Isn't like it? your accent gives cultural appropriation a bad name. Dear America, for the past few decades you have come to Africa to shoot our animals. And you say you do this to help us. And we are so grateful, we want to return the favor. You see all of these stray dogs and cats that are running across your country? I'm going to kill them. That's right. As part of a new program, rich Africans will pay to hunt stray dogs and cats in America. How are you so terrible? I know white people who have better <laughs> African accents. And Roy, First that of all, Joseph, 
you are <laughs> insulting me and I do not appreciate your insults. Uh-huh. But but I always I always I always <laughs> love I always love doing this and we've done a bunch of sketches with you where like you have to do the African voice uh, African accent and um because people laugh at me because they think I can never do an American accent it's impossible I can't and then I look at Roy and I go like well okay at least it also goes the other way because you know what my African. <laughs> My African accent is so terrible that Africans don't even get offended by it. Like they send me messages on Twitter and stuff, and they just go, "That was terrible, Roy. Well done." Yes, <laughs> like, they, 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 they treat you the way a kindergarten teacher treats a kindergarten who has drawn a stick man. Well done. This you you, 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 you it's, it's very yeah. Because I've I've, I've I've like even Dave, you know, the other African who normally they are very patronizing towards you, and this is because everyone assumes everyone assumes that an African accent everyone assumes that Roy. You know, stand-up comedian extraordinaire should be able to do an African accent, and then he Absolutely starts to do it, and you go like, "Wow!" Okay. Absolutely not. Yeah, we know why he went to a knockoff Juilliard. <laughs> Juilliard. Juilliard. Uh, Eduardo. <laughs> now, you swim in waters on this topic where there are no punchlines, there are no jokes. It is straight up stop this action from happening. You know, as an advocate for the cause to ban trophy hunting, how do you feel? watching the segment because I always feel like with issues this serious, you could always watch it and go, oh, but you didn't mention the thing or the other thing. So how did it feel seeing the segment uh, air? You know, trophy hunting, I don't know if it if it stops shocking me. I mean, it shocks me and it doesn't shock me because I've now spoken to and read the accounts of so many trophy hunters and the things that they say as if it was a normal thing to say. I mean, there's one guy who was a president of of Safari Club International, and he's talking about how the most intimate um, and um, and most moving thing you can do in life is to hunt an elephant. And he talks about the joy that he feels when he sees a lion's head blow up in a cloud of smoke. You know, you, and they talk about it's it's um it's like losing your virginity when you shoot your first animal. It's like it's beyond parody. It's almost mm. as if these people exist on a d- different plane. They are not part of the human race. And you know what? That actually makes it sometimes a bit of a difficult issue to engage because it is so, I mean, it's so disgusting. For a lot of people, it is so upsetting to see these essentially defenseless animals killed just for fun. And whatever the trophy hunters say, that retroactively try to justify it, they don't fly halfway around the world to kill an animal for anything other than the pleasure of it, because that's what they enjoy doing. And we actually sort of thought, well, look, I mean, there are some people who just turn away from the issue because it is so distressing. I mean, is there another way we can engage with them? So we actually set up a fake trophy hunting company. It's got a website. It's called trophyhuntingholidays.com. It's kind of like the Amazon of trophy hunters. (laughs) These are the click and kill travel firm specialists. And we've recorded these mock TV adverts. We've got a couple of actors in there. You've got these guys come and earn your stripes shoot a zebra today just one thousand dollars we've got a series of these adverts going out there and we thought you know is this a way to uh, <laughs> engage with you but all of the stuff that was in there it was all based on a hundred percent fact there is actually a website it's a bit like the amazon for trophy hunters it's called bookyourhunt.com you can literally go on there and check an animal that you want to shoot. So you, I mean, it's got 300 different different species, 350 different species you can choose from. Everything from squirrels and skunks to lions and leopards. I mean, you name it. You want to shoot a kangaroo, a wallaby. I mean, it, it's all there. And yeah, it's got all the details, how you get there, how you, and then, you know, they'll help you find somebody to skin it and, and preserve it and take it home for you. Taxidermist. And, yeah. They still treat their employers way better than Jeff Bezos treats his. So <laughs> I guess they have that going for them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in the trophy hunting world, this is one of the things that, mm-hmm. you know, because I've spoken, you know, to people in Africa who are village headmen, they're community mm-hmm. chiefs, they're local MPs and councillors, and, and ask them what they think about it. And they say, look, whatever these guys say, we don't get to see any of the money. Mm. They say, you know, the money comes from trophy hunting back into the communities. Well, we ain't seen a cent of mm. it. And the only that- people who are employed by these, but in terms of local, local rural communities, you know, they're, they've got a, a, a menial job as a skinner or a cook or as mm. a cleaner. They'll only have two or three. The money stays either in the US or Europe because a lot of 
European and American companies own All these companies trophy run. hunting outfitters. That's the name of the, the companies that do this. Or, of course, you know, they sell these holidays in the big conventions in Las Vegas, uh, in, in Germany and in Spain. And the money stays in those accounts in those countries. So the amount of money that ever reaches somebody at the, at the end in the community is zilch. I mean, no, no, no. everyone I've spoken to has says, look, you know, it's crazy. We don't see any of it. And, and, and we simply don't understand this because, look, even if somebody here is, is, is really hungry or really desperate, they cannot go and touch that animal. But a big, fat, white American can fly halfway around the world and kill oh. that same animal just for fun. Because that's all it is. It's for pleasure. It's for entertainment. It's for joy. And when you talk to the trophy hunters, as I have, I've, I've pretended to be a trophy hunter to sort of get behind the, the scenes, if you like, to actually say, look, come mm -hmm. on, we're, you're talking to one of one of us now. We're, we're the same. We're both trophy hunters. What do you really think about this? And they're, just, you know, they're telling me, look, yeah, it's great. It's so much fun. You know, we'd go out hunting in the day. And then at night, we'd grab a few beers and we'd go and shoot some of the monkeys out of the trees just for fun. And they actually say this as if this is a normal, acceptable human thing to say. This is their mindset, their mentality. That almost feels like the craziest undercover operation, because what if they go like, oh, you have to kill an animal to prove that you're not a fed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The thing for me, one of the problems I have on first value, forget the moral and ethical questions. The big problem I have with it is the optics as an African. The optics of a white man with a gun storming Africa just isn't great. With our history with colonialism, the thing is Africans have a lot more pressing issues at, right now, so maybe trophy hunting is not exactly at the top of the list. But the optics, if I were a trophy hunter, I would say the optics just doesn't serve my cause. No, I mean, this, with is, the history a, this of, is a continuation, yeah. it's a yes, continuation yes, exactly. of colonialism, isn't With it? the history of colonialism, white men coming into Africa with guns and then saying, we're doing this for your own benefit, for your own good. The optics isn't great. And then also there's the fact that well, who is the face of trophy hunting in the West? It's Don Jr. and Eric Trump. And I'm saying if the face of your platform of, or if the face of the thing you're doing is Don Jr. and Eric Trump, you need to change the damn poster. <laughs> you need to find, you need to find someone more like Cable, like, you know, get Dolly Parton or Baby Yod or something. <laughs> After the break, I want to get into it with you, Eduardo, on the history of trophy hunting and how you got into this. Because I'm always interested in how people find the thing that's their thing. You know, like for you, it's trophy hunting. For me, it's winning Oscars for wonderful accent work and in <laughs> many, many American films. Uh, it's Beyond the Scenes. We'll be right back. <laughs> yes, welcome back to Beyond the Scenes. I am Roy Wood Jr., we are discussing trophy hunting in Africa with us, an anti-trophy hunting activist, Eduardo Gonsalves, and Ugandan daily show writer, Joseph Opio. Hello, Joseph. Your accent is more offensive. It's How like, was it's that? Like you're putting on Afri it's like you're putting on African face, but like in audio <laughs> like form. It's, it's offensive to me as an African. It's... I, I speak on behalf... wearing blacker face? I... Not black face, <laughs> blacker face. <laughs> So Eduardo, how far back, let's go back, let's, let's just dig into the origins of trophy hunting. How far back does the history of this terror go? I refrain from calling it a sport. That's the other thing they try to do to get people, to get society on board. Oh, I'm a big game hunter and sports. Like, no. How far back does this horrible shit go and what got you involved in it? Yeah, and they also call themselves outdoorsmen. That's the other kind of, uh, yeah. And they, talk, they don't talk about killing animals, they call about harvesting harvesting game there's all kind of ways that they use to you know it's all smoke and mirrors to try to deflect from the reality anyway going back to the history of it yet yeah, there's little bits of it going back you know a few thousand years but really it begins with the brits in africa and in asia so it's the beginning of the british empire the colonies the colonization of africa 
and of Asia. And they exported this, this sport. You know, it was for, to give uh, the, the officers something to do as a nice hobby. It was to sort of give them a bit of a break, something positive to do. And and then it got quite interesting because they would write about it. And so the, the Times in London would, you know, carry these epic tales of these uh, adventurers, etc. And that was the 19th century. And then the, and, and, you, and you had guys who were taking, I mean, huge numbers. You know, there was one trophy hunt alone, which involved uh, the British royal family, actually, including the then Prince of Wales. And they engaged in this absolute bloodbath of a hunt, during which they actually extinguished a species. So the last remaining member in the wild of the quagga, which is a species a bit like the zebra, is thought to have been shot by the Prince of Wales. And they literally had blood up to their elbows. There's these graphic accounts of the hunt. Come the 20th century, then the Americans get involved, thanks largely to Theodore Roosevelt. So he, with the help of the British colonies, he goes on this train trip. Um, they laid on, the, the Brits lay on this luxury train for him and his son Kermit to go around Africa. And during that year, they shoot over 500 animals, including lions, lots of lions. He loved, loved lions. Theodore Roosevelt loved lions. And they actually built this seat that would be stuck on the front of the train. So, and he would sit there with his rifle trainer would be chugging along they'd see an animal a lion or whatever he'd shoot it they'd stop the train they'd get the lion's body on board skin it etc and he would carry on uh, on on this great festival and it didn't just grows into this industry so, so he now, built like a jump seat yeah at the front of the train yeah like one of those sidecars on a motorcycle. Yeah. I don't remember that scene in Night at the Museum. <laughs> uh, but, wow. When you say the thing about the British royal family actually leading to the extinction mm. of a species, and I'm right now thinking, wow, so Prince Andrew is not the worst. <laughs> he's got competition. That gets you thinking, yeah. <laughs> so he's on the train, he's shooting mm. lions, he's, and yeah. walk us through more of the evolution of that. It just becomes this organized industry, and it really takes off in the 70s when a guy called C.J. McElroy sets up Safari Club International. Now you've got this major industrial lobby group, and it's also, you know, it creates an award system. I mean, they've got about 80 different prizes that you can get for shooting lots of animals. So one of these prizes is called the Hunting Achievement Award. Now, it's got all of these different levels. To get to the copper prize, copper level, you've got to sh have shot animals from at least 10 different species. Bronze, 20 different species. Silver, 50. Then you go up. To get to gold medal, you got to shoot animals from at least 100 different species. And that's not the end of it, because there's a diamond prize as well. To do that... Come on now. Yeah, you've got to shoot animals from at least 125 different species around the world. And they've got to be big animals, not just uh, little ones. They've got to mm. be big enough to count. Yeah, And so it's this organized, I mean, mass slaughter. Th this is the thing that really gets me about trophy hunting. It is not meeting any human need of any kind whatsoever. You can't argue it in the same way as food or for skins mm -hmm. or whatever. This is just to feed vanity. Because that all it is, these people, they take selfies and they take the souvenirs and that for them is sport. That's what makes it fundamentally okay. wrong. So then if it's so fundamentally wrong, why do the governments in African countries support it? You just can't be moving through Africa without the paperwork. So you damn sure just can't be walking around with a dead tiger in your carry-on bag acting like you didn't come to the country to murder animals. So why do they support it, Eduardo? Well, simply corruption i'm afraid to say it but you know there is a lot you know when there is, are those trophy fees paid those fees do not go to conservation they do not go to local communities they either stay in the hands of officials or they just disappear look you know let's take the example of cecil the lion he was a beloved lion had this wonderful black mane and he was radio collared he was being researched by oxford university scientists they were looking at what they were actually looking at the impact of trophy hunting on wild lion populations actually and they found that about a third of the lions they were studying even though they had radio collars on were being shot by trophy hunters so even the the fact that they were visibly part of an official government research program didn't protect them from the hunter's bullets. So Walter Palmer, this American dentist, he goes and shoots this line where he shouldn't. He didn't have a permit for it. And, you know, he, then they try to conceal the radio collar. There's all sorts of shenanigans. And there's a guy called Johnny Rodriguez, who is a Zimbabwean conservationist. He blows the whistle on it. It gets out into the wider world. And it becomes one of the most talked about stories in the world, largely because, in my view, People didn't know trophy hunting was still going on. It was a shock. It was thinking people think, hey, 
surely this ended with the colonies, with imperialism, mm. with all of that. You know, this ended in the days of empire. Are people shooting lions for fun? And, you know, the trophy hunting industry has worked very hard to actually keep this quiet. You know, why isn't this talked about? They work quite hard, actually, to keep it under, under wraps. And yet the numbers of animals that are being shot are enormous. You know, a trophy hunter shoots an animal every three minutes. You know, even during COVID, when people can't fly around the world, there's all these travel restrictions. Americans were flying to Africa. They were shooting black rhino, cheetah, elephant, who are now endangered. By the way, there's only 7,000 cheetahs left in the world. There's, less, there's about 3,000 black rhinos. This is going on even when supposedly we're under lockdown, people can't travel the world. And it's just so, so nonsensical. But it's barbaric. It's barbaric. And I'll tell you why. Because, again, this is one of the things that doesn't often get talked about. The pain and the suffering that the animals undergo, right? These people who shoot animals, they're not professionals. They're not snipers, these guys. These are guys who have, <laughs> you know, they shoot a gun every now and again. And what they do is they're shooting these animals from 200 yards away because they don't want to get hurt by, you know, a lion or whatever coming anywhere near it. So they're shooting through the scopes. And they're not shooting them in the head, which would be, a you know, an instant brain death shot. Yeah. shot. Mm. Exactly, a kill mm. shot. Because that would make the, the trophy look ugly, all right? You can't mm. skin that and put that on your wall. It looks pretty rough. So what they do is they try to do this heart's lung shot through the shoulder. Now, if you're an amateur shot... You're trying to do that from 200 yards, and you've got to count on the animals staying still. You've With got to wind. count on there being no wind. Wind, yeah. Right? Moisture in oh, the air. Right. Now, there's been actually a, a number of state authorities in the U.S. that have looked at trophy hunting in the States, and the number's about the same. Over half of the animals that are shot by trophy hunters, they don't die instantaneously. They die these slow, painful deaths. Like Cecil, you know? Because Cecil... Right, um, what's his name? Walter Palmer. He was trying to win this prize from Safari Club International, which is for shooting big game with novelty weapons like crossbows and bow and longbow and, and handguns. Because they actually want you, they give you a special prize if you shoot an elephant with a handgun, okay? And he was trying to get one of these prizes for shooting a lion with a longbow. And he shot Cecil. But Cecil didn't die instantaneously, and he managed to somehow crawl under the bush, and, and he couldn't find him, and he wouldn't take a shot with a rifle to put him out of his misery, because he wouldn't then be eligible for that prize. So he thinks, ah, I'm going to go home, have dinner, you know, have a sleep, kind of come out and see if the animal's dead in the morning. He goes back out in the morning with the professional hunter, that is the guide who takes him out. They can't see Cecil, because he's still kind of hidden under the bush, but they can hear him. They can hear him because he is gasping. He is he's gurgly. He is literally drowning on the blood in his lungs. That is the reality of what happens with most animals. And I know because when I spoke to a lot of trophy hunters when I was undercover, and they were telling me about the absolutely shocking injuries that they were inflicting on animals, and they were laughing. They were laughing as if this was a funny thing, and you could actually just talk about this normally. When I was reading up on Cecil's case, I was shocked that initially he was in a protected area, area where he couldn't be hunted, and then they lured him out. They actually used bait to lure him out, and then into like a, to, of course, into an area where he yeah, could out be of shot the legally. Uh, yes, where he could okay. be shot, and then when he did that, he didn't die. So it took twelve hours for him to find it, for them to find, it, find him and then kill him. And uh, I was like, frankly, like that. Yeah. That, seemed you know, like, that seems like endless agony, like 12 hours of. When I was talking to conservationists about it, they were saying, you know, the, the hunters, they treat these national parks as mines. They're mining the animals because they're protected and they're, you know, yes. healthy mm -hmm. and so on. So they lure them out. And literally these national parks, like the Hwangi National Park, which is where uh, Cecil, Cecil had his yeah. territory, mm -hmm. um, it, it, all of these national parks, they surround, they surround them with these estates. And so, yeah, they lured them. And, but well, that's mm. what they do with so many animals. They do that with leopards. They do that with, or, you know, they set packs of dogs on, on, on these creatures as well. And the numbers that are being shot. You know, some of these big trophy hunters that are shooting hundreds of lions each, right? This is, this is where we're at with some of these species. We are in an extinction emergency. Lions, experts are telling me that there's probably fewer than 10,000 lions left on planet Earth. 
In 1970, the number was around 200,000. Okay, so in 50 years, the lion population has absolutely collapsed in Africa from 200,000 to 10,000. Elephants, you look at the, what's happened to the elephants in Africa. There were 20 million when the British turned up in Africa and started shooting them. There's now 400,000. And actually, this is how I got into the issue, because this was the president of Botswana, the outgoing one, Sir Etsy Ian Karma. And he banned trophy hunting in Botswana because of what was happening to elephants throughout Africa. And because of that, Botswana now has a third of all the remaining African elephants on the planet. One third are in this one country, which is the side of, well, the size of France. So it's not, you know, it's not a big country. It's got twice as many as any other country in Africa. And he protected them. And the mm. elephant populations there stabilized. The only other place where the ele there's good news for elephants is Kenya. Why? Because Kenya banned trophy hunting okay. in 1977 and we're seeing this pattern right across the board lion populations are collapsing except in Kenya elephant populations collapsing except in Kenya rhino populations are collapsing except in Kenya one thing Eduardo raised earlier was the issue of corruption right one of the things I noticed when we even did the segment one of the reactions from trophy hunters was we would like to help conservation but we can't help that Africans are corrupt that should be up to Africans to fix, right? They were saying you can't hold Instead us. of just stopping yes. hunting, just don't hunt. Yeah, it's the same reason people went like, oh, we want patronized companies which use sweatshops because they could have said, oh, us will just buy. It's up to Apple, it's up to Nike to actually pay people well. But people went like, no, we can't actually morally support a company when we know the money we pay doesn't trickle down to the workers. In this case, the big game companies that take you out on the hunt. Yes, exactly. And Eduardo has shown you research shows the money doesn't trickle down. So, Eduardo, to that point, when you wrote this book, when you, when you go on this journey of being an undercover trophy hunter, you know, there's a lot of questions that I have. A lot of it you've already touched on, but I want to talk to you about you, man. Like, getting first-hand accounts from trophy hunters and they're just talking about animals like they're nothing. Talk to me a little bit about the emotional toll that that journey took on you and how were you able to kind of deal with that? Like, how did how do you, how do I say this nicely, Joe? How did you not kill some of these folks when you was on the hunt with them pretending that you was cool with hunting? Well, you know what? I was saved from having to actually go out and hunt by COVID because there were these travel restrictions. So a lot of the British hunters, they couldn't actually travel. So instead, what they were, they were telling me about the hunts that they had been on the previous year. And they were telling me in a lot of detail. But yeah, you know, it does drive you to the point of madness because you kind of think yeah, this is like a parallel universe that, that, that you're inhabiting or invading even. You just want to scream out and say, how can you say such a thing? How can you even use that language, use those words as if it's a normal thing to say? But, you know, it, it, it's really because I've been doing some more research. I'm writing another book at the moment, and I've been speaking to a lot of psychologists and criminologists, and and they're telling me, you know, th these people isn't just, you, you know, it isn't just sad. This is bad. This is dangerous. These people are potentially dangerous. I mean, there is this proven link. I mean, that's why the FBI in the U.S. right has now classed serious animal cruelty as a grade A felony. Why? Because of all the links that people involved in that have got to drug running, gun crime and so on. So, you know, there's a lot of very serious crime involved here. And you look at, for example, in the U.S., I mean, the guys who are behind that terrible tragedy, the Columbine High School massacre, you know, they started out as animal abusers. The Boston Strangler, he was a guy who started out as an animal abuser. Mm. You're saying the lack of empathy isn't just limited to, it spreads all across. But then won't some trophy hunters say you're using like the few selective, uh, bad uh, animal abuser turned, you know, ad, cruel adults, when they say you're using them to taint the whole hunting community? Yeah, I'm not a poacher. I hunt mine for yes. proper money in a proper reserve. I go to a reserve. I'm not like those hootlums out there. Oh, I'm not like Cecil. Because yeah. I, I, I know the FBI says that that's one of the indicators. That's like one of the behavioral indicators. Like when a kid is growing up, if a kid is cruel towards animals, then you need to intervene immediately or else. But then won't trophy hunters say you're actually... You know, you're using like a very selective, rare and small sample size to taint the whole 
Look, I'm sure there's some very nice people out there who go trophy hunting, okay, that in many ways are seem respectable and so on. But this is the facts of the data. So when you look at the data, and this is the criminologists and the psychologists who are telling me this, right, and they're showing me the data, saying, look, you are seeing that people involved in trophy hunting are more likely to be involved in domestic violence. They are more likely to be involved in child abuse. You know, there is even in the cycle of the year, so just before the hunting season begins and you get that kind of buck fever thing that's when domestic violence oh, also spikes. peaks mm. exactly so okay. it's this, these same kind of oh, i don't know how to describe it but these kind of emotional drives these urges and again you've got to read about some of the crazy stuff that trophy hunters actually write and say as if it was normal about how you know th there's one guy who's i mean he's a respectable guy he's a lawyer he's involved in different international organizations and he's saying that trophy hunting should be made a rite of passage for all men He's a guy who's actually talked about, you know, the first time he killed an animal, it was like losing his virginity. It had the same feeling. You know, how, <laughs> I, I am sometimes lost for words with it. I'm often not, as you can tell. But, you know, sometimes when you just try to get into the psychology and the minds of these people, you know, they're dangerous. They are dangerous people. Well, this is a dangerous mindset. Let's put it that way. It was striking, Roy, I'd have to say, when we did the sketch at the end, uh, with rich Africans coming over to when we turned the tables, uh, it was striking to not to hunt how rich the people's audience, pets. Yes, how the audience uh, reacted to that because that really brought it home. For every dog we shoot, a portion of the profits will go to American communities, up to three percent. And I know what you are thinking. What about my pets? I'm going to kill them too. Yes. Pets that have reached old age will also be hunted by rich Africans. No more watching Fluffles struggle to climb the stairs. Instead, Fluffles will be shot and mounted in a Nigerian's man cave. It would be intriguing for me because most of these trophy hunters, as Eduardo said, you know, they have disposable income. They are pretty well off. They are respected professionals. They are very successful in their chosen careers. It would be intriguing for me to ask them how they would react if Africans were coming over, not to hunt big game, but to hunt their pets. Yeah. Yep. That's if right. an African said, I love dogs so much, yeah, so for me, turning the tables, because that would be very intriguing for me too. And then you went like, as we said in the sketch, we are doing this for you, because there are benefits, we are paying you, and we love dogs so much. Yeah, because uh, yeah. you have too many dogs, we need yes. to shoot one. Let's talk a little bit after the break about, you know, ways that we, the general public, Eduardo, can help to stop this, help to bring awareness to this. And I want to talk more specifically about the work that you're doing doing now to ban trophy hunting. This is beyond the scenes. So Eduardo, you've done your work as an author to bring awareness to this issue, but you're also the founder of the campaign to ban trophy hunting. What are some of your outreach strategies, you know, to get people to join the cause? You've already done the work of studying the hunter. Now the Laban, how do you get people like us who think that trophy hunting was just poaching rhinos for ivory, but clearly it's layers and layers deeper than that? What are some of your outreach strategies to get people to join your cause? The main thing we're trying to do is just tell people the truth and tell people the whole story, the whole shocking story, because a lot of people don't know. You know, And I talk to government ministers as well as members of parliament and members of the public, and they don't know. I mean, there was one government minister I spoke to just the other day, and she was saying, trophy hunting. Hey, but I thought all of that was finished with years ago. And I'm saying, no, it's happening. And it's happening here in the sense that there are British trophy hunters and that's the thing i mean at the moment i'm trying to get people to understand that this isn't just you know the guys like walter palmer that american dentist who shot cecil the lion you know, there are people from britain there are people from china there are people from russia you know there's a russian mountain hunters club so it's their trophy hunting group some of its directors have got very close links to putin you've got a growing number of chinese people going out to africa now and they're using the laws because this is the weird thing about the law okay so you cannot go and shoot a black rhino or any kind of rhino in order to take off its horn and take it away to grind it up to sell it as aphrodisiac to do all of that that is illegal that's called poaching however you can turn up and say hey but i'm a trophy hunter and i'm going to import this as a hunting trophy so you can shoot the same rhino you can take its horn you can take it back to china and you can grind it up and take it into the huh? black market 
right? And this is the crazy thing about, so there's, there's international regulations, CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, okay? This is the law that's supposed to stop poaching and protect endangered wildlife. But there's this loophole. And so at one point, you know, a huge proportion of the rhino legal hunting trophies that were then going back into China and Vietnam and into the black market there was through this loophole. And exactly the same as be happening with, and you you got bears, including polar bears, right? We're talking about climate change, polar bears being on the threat of, you know, mm. being threatened with extinction. You can still go to Canada and shoot polar bears. You can go to Canada and shoot pretty much any bear. They shoot about 20, 12, 13,000 bears a year, trophy hunters do, from America and from elsewhere. But you can shoot a polar bear if you're one of these wildlife traffickers and claim that you're a trophy hunter, and then you can take its gallbladder because they like the gall they use that for all of these traditional chinese medicines oh, which of course have got not approved they even shoot bears for their and let me use the word their penises right for the baculum the, the the penis bone because that again is supposed to have aphrodisiac values this is all done legally because that's the law on trophy hunting says right okay you can't shoot that animal to traffic it and to sell them but yeah if you say that you're a trophy hunter you can go and shoot that exact same animal take it back home so they're basically saying you uh, climate change, you can't wipe out polar bears. That's our job. <laughs> For me, the thing, Roy, that intrigues me about this whole thing, and I think, Eduardo, like the biggest challenge you have is to get the people on the ground, I think, to care as deeply and as much as you do. Because as I said, Africans have more pressing issues and the government is obviously, governments are pro this. When Sisso the lion was killed, it wasn't big news in Zimbabwe until actually it hit like the big time in the UK. The BBC covered the story. And then the Zimbabweans were, oh, we had this iconic lion. They didn't know it had been killed. So the people on the ground, for them to care as much, I think they care a lot more about poach, poaching these days, but trophy hunting, maybe not so much. It's the same thing with, I think, climate, climate change. But the irony of this whole the thing your brother just told me is so many people thought trophy hunting was no more till trophy hunters started posting pictures of themselves with animals they had killed. Social so, media. Yeah, so for me, that's that's a very interesting, like... Well, for some Africans, it is an issue. Let me tell you why. Mm -hmm. It's because it is perpetuating poverty. It's perpetuating exploitation. It's perpetuating land ownership by a wealthy minority mm -hmm. elite and so on. Oh, okay. There was a study uh, done by economists in South Africa that showed that if there was a wholesale switch from trophy hunting to photographic safaris, that would create oh, 11 times yeah. more mm -hmm. jobs for people in poor rural areas in South Africa. And that's the case because... You know, again, the numbers don't add up. You shoot a lion like Cecil, you know, maybe ten thousand dollars is going to end up supposedly in the conservation fund, although it never does. The cost of conserving a lion like Cecil and its habitat is a million dollars a year. Ten thousand dollars doesn't is a drop in the mm. ocean. It's but what now. does work for conservation as well as for local people to is photo safaris. Mm. Because they mm. you know, an average lion like Cecil, okay, he's gonna generate something like a hundred thousand mm. dollars a year. So over an average lifespan of fifteen years, that's a million and a half dollars. He's paying for con his conservation by staying alive. These uh, photo safari industries, they employ so many more people. They pay yes, them better yes. and they work mm -hmm. all year round because hunting is largely a seasonal activity. And, mm. they, and they're working in management jobs, you know, in, instead of in menial, skivvy so, jobs as a skinner or a tracker or, you know, a cook I or like a cleaner. This. Yeah, this is, this is why it is good for the economy of Africa. And that's why, like you know, when President um, Karma banned trophy hunting in Botswana, it wasn't just because of the conservation issues. It was because he was seeing that photo safaris was doing so much better for local people in Botswana. And some places were just switching before there was any law from trophy <laughs> hunting to photo safaris <laughs> because it was better for local people. Full stop. The thing I was asking you about the African, like the people on the ground, like you know how like climate change, even them, they're still like, having a problem because, like, you know, people still burn charcoal and they still do all these things. And I'm thinking like, how would you, because the thing has to be so pressing that people go like, we need to stop this. Like, I wish Africans were as passionate about this issue. Like, uh, the way you're passionate about it. Like, I wish, I wish, here's what I wanted to say. I wish it was a voting issue. Mm. 
if that well, makes sense. Well, look, I like, mean, so for for some Africans, it is. Mm. Yeah, there's a, no, but no, but I'm going like, because you need a critical for so so like sure. when it comes to politicians, for you to move the needle politically, you need like a critical mass. People have yeah. to feel like their jobs are in danger, yeah. like the yeah, local to get the area MP. Changes. Yes, yes, it has to be a, a personal issue. Yes, not an empathy issue. Otherwise, you're going to need every African government leader to be like Kama, which can't happen because he was he's a visionary. Like his dad, like he comes from, like I I I know I, like I know a lot about him. Like even I went to Botswana, people admire him a lot because he comes from a line of like almost statesmen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But not every like African leader, especially the local leaders, you know, they're struggling. It's the same thing like in America. They, they are getting if I'm an African politician and a trophy hunter is paying part of my campaign money or they're sponsoring my campaign, it's very hard for me to... So I need to almost choose between do I take the money from the trophy hunting lobbyist or do I risk losing my... So, like, how can you almost yeah, turn it's it It's environmentalism into, in yes. America. It's like you you take the oil money... Yes, how do you turn it into, like, a voting issue? It, it, it's... Do you know what? It's about mm. the dollar in your pocket because it, trophy hunting is holding Africa back. Yes. It is perpetuating the old economic structures which deliberately mm. you know, were set up to keep a certain class of people, a certain race yes. of people, obviously. And to only um, enrich poor. a minority, yes. Exactly. Mm. You know, so apartheid might have ended in South Africa, but actually, you know, you look at the, the, yes, the, still, the, yeah. mm. the if you look at the industry of trophy hunting, so who are the people who own the land where the, the trophy hunters yeah. mm. go where it's the trophy hunting goes on? Mm. Who own the companies that's, that's lease the yes. land. Mm -hmm. Okay, these Follow are the, the same money. people. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's all those people. But you know, there are some, pa and, and you know, partly our responsibility here in the West is to give a platform to those powerful African voices mm -hmm. who have a view to. I once went to Downing Street, which is where the Prime Minister of England lives, mm -hmm. with a seven foot tall senior elder from the Maasai tribe. It was January, it was so cold, and he was in traditional gear. But yes. you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, he was able to address them, and he told the Prime Minister how. In olden days, actually part of the Maasai warrior uh, um, r ritual was to kill a lion to show that you were a warrior. Yeah, they, had, a man, they, yeah. they had now abandoned that. And mm. in fact, they were now, they had taken pride in becoming custodians of their natural heritage. And that actually part of the whole warrior ritual is much more about that now. And also, of course, in Kenya, every single Maasai high school kid or high school age child gets a high school education thanks entirely to the photo to, safari yeah, tourism yes 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 that's mm. where it the, all comes the whole mass the whole Maasai Mara yes it's, yeah? yeah you know and mm. we've got to give people like Karma, like uh, you know the, the Maasai elders etc we've got to give them a platform I mean at the moment they you know then then they're, they're, for reasons we all understand they're excluded mm. from society they're not given you know the same access to the media and mm. so on mm. so we've got to give these people and you know because I tell you I've spoken to a lot of uh, you know village headmen and community leaders mm. and they're all scathing about trophy mm. hunting largely for the economic reasons rather than mm. necessarily mm. the conservation ones they say yeah. mm. where's this money that's well, supposed to come we, to me. We know, yeah, we know there's money. Yeah, we yeah. Know there's Whenever I go is. to the, mm -hmm. you know, to, to ask, look, you know, we need a new roof for our health centre or mm -hmm. our, our school or whatever, they say, ah, oh, there's no money. They've been telling me that for 20 years, mm -hmm. and yet they've been conning us to say that, you know. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, I don't know, changing mindset globally here in the West, the US government has actually... No. No, because I feel like I feel like the West. It's the thing you said about nine out of ten people. Yeah. The West. It feels like a voting issue. It feels yeah. like if you, if there was a congressman, yeah. and you went like this, congressman is a trophy hunter. There's no way they are winning re-election. Yeah. Like that's that feels like that feels like an issue you could hit them with, especially like in liberal cities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, at the I'm, moment, you see, SCI yeah. is one of the biggest packs on Capitol Hill. So I mean, their pack is bigger than General Motors. It's bigger than mm. Delta Airlines. Wow. I, mean, they, I mean, it all goes to Republicans, obviously. But mm. their pack is one of the biggest on Capitol Hill, and they've set up this thing called the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, and it's basically to hoover up members of the House of Reps, the senators, mm. also state governors, and they they've all brought them into this. Club, which basically says, you keep towing our line, we'll keep giving you money at election time. So one half of all governors, reps and senators mm. are members of the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, which is the congressional presence 
of the trophy hunting industry. Mm. So they've got their uh, claws yes. into the into the system. But yeah, it does change politicians when you tell them the yes. numbers. Mm. So about three weeks ago, here in the UK, the government started uh, briefing political editors that they were going to drop the ba- the bill banning trophies. And, and and so obviously they got in touch with me, the political editors, and said, hey, listen, we're being told this. I said, okay, very good timing. I've actually just had an opinion poll done. It tells me two things. Firstly, 92% of Conservative Party voters, the government's own supporters, mm-hmm. want this bill implemented as soon yes, as yes. possible. Only 1% disagree. Second, 34% of Conservative voters say they're going to ditch the party if they don't follow through on mm. this manifesto. Mm. I publicised one of those big article in the Times and the Guardian, blah, blah, and I briefed ministers privately on, on the second because it could have been a bit, uh, anyway, but it's incendiary if I put that in the newspapers. Mm. Anyway, big coverage, and then I get a call from the government ministry from one of my um, contacts there saying, wow, that story about the poll, it's like a nuclear bomb. The minister is about to declare in an hour's time that they're going to do a U-turn on the U-turn. They're going ahead with a ban mm-hmm. after all. And sure enough, an hour later, a statement given to the BBC, the government say, of course we were always going to do this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all of these rumours about us not doing it. <laughs> what, mm-hmm. what were they Unfounded, thinking? Unfounded, yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Nicely and, done. Mm-hmm. And, and the figures are really, really strong, you know, uh, uh, and, and st- getting stronger. Because yes. we've been polling consistently for about two, three years. I mean, I mean, they sound like election results in North Korea. They're so good for us, you know. That's the only that, <laughs> that's the only thing I feel like politicians respond yeah, to. Yeah. So the thing is, they, they're like, up for re-election, mm, you know. Yes. They they don't mm. want to lose their jobs. So one of the things we're actually doing at the moment, we're actually doing a roadshow around marginal conservative constituencies. So where the Conservative MP has got a majority oh, um, yeah, yeah, of, yeah. of less than five percent. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. And we're going to them and we're saying. Now, you support the government policy, don't you? Come on out and come and do this photo op with us. And we've got a great quote from uh, you know, Dame Judy Dench and Joanna Lumley, because they're amongst our supporters, say what a great campaign this local MP is doing. They get great fame, you know, right up you in see, their local you see, paper. That's, you see, that's, that's what I was saying. Now, if you have Don Jr. endorsing you, it's not good. <laughs> if, you have, if, you, if you have Dame Judy Dench, then it's good for you. If you have, like, yeah. that's what I was saying. The optics yeah. just doesn't work. Yeah. So let's let's end here. What are some campaigns that we could donate to, and what are some companies um, or organizations that you are a part of, Edward, or that people need to be aware of on this issue? So the campaign to ban trophy hunting, it's an international organization. You can find us at bantrophyhunting.org and you can find all the information about us there and all of the issues. And, we, and you know, we've, we've actually named and got photos of trophy hunters so we can give them, you know, a name and a face because these people, they want to remain faceless. Well, we're actually putting some names out there so people can actually understand what is really happening. And we're at the moment, we're, we're, you know, we're coordinating campaigns in a number of places. We've got an international foundation. We've been helping our colleagues in Belgium who the Belgian parliament in the last few days passed a resolution unanimously to ban trophies right so this is this is hot news we've just done an opinion poll here in the UK it shows nine out of ten voters want trophies banned as soon as possible and in fact there's been polls in the US that have shown similar figures around elephant trophies you know nearly nine out of ten voters in the US think it's wrong for people to go to wherever Africa and shoot elephants and bring those trophies back. We are on a journey here. We're wanting countries like Britain, the US, etc. to stop imports of these trophies. But ultimately, as our goal is the abolition of trophy hunting. Because look, right, you know, we've banned bear baiting, we've banned cock fighting, we've banned dog fighting, we've banned, you know, yep. all of these different things, they've been kicked into the dustbin of history, which is the only place they deserve to be. How come trophy hunting has fallen through the gap? Well, we're trying to make sure it doesn't and that it's next. And in the same way that we have tackled, as a human society, great social moral evils like apartheid, like slavery, all of the things, we can abolish trophy hunting. We can change that mindset that says that it is somehow okay to abuse, torture, maim and kill animals defenseless, living creatures, sentient animals, as if they're just a pile of rubble. Well, I cannot thank you enough for being, oh, excuse me, say that again. Well, I cannot thank you enough, Eduardo Gonsalves, for being a part of the show. The book is Undercover Trophy Hunter. No one is going to buy the book because it feels like it's being sold by a Nigerian prince. (laughs) 
That's the problem, Roy. <laughs> the book is Undercover Trophy Hunter. Also, thank you to Daily Show writer Joseph Opio. Joe Opio, pleasure, I will yeah. I will see you around the building and we can take some dialect classes. I, a little bit I'll later. see you around HR. Uh, the because this is now an HR issue, Roy. That's all the time we have for today. Hopefully, we've taken you beyond the scenes. See you next week. I can't believe you didn't like my accent, man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <Don't, don't. laughs>